Hello, I'm Luca Torix, and welcome to my Celts faction guide for Rome Total War Barbarian Invasion. Today, we're going to be talking about the Celts, their units, and some campaign strategy. So, let's get straight into it. To complete the main campaign, you have to hold 16 settlements, including Britannia Superior, Britannia Inferior, and Lugdunesis, which I believe is a region in France, but we'll uh, have a look at that in a minute. The Celts start off in the region known really as Scotland nowadays and Northern Ireland. You can't see them on the map because they are quote unquote non playable, but you can sort of unlock them by fiddling around with some data files. By this point, I should have made a video on how to do that, so I'll leave it in the description if I have already made that video. But anyway, the game describes the Celts as old fashioned but effective mixture of lightly armoured troops. So. Quite a different army, really. I mean, you know, I quite like the old-fashioned kind of look to them, but also can make it a little bit more difficult because there isn't a huge amount of ranged troops, for example, but we'll talk about that in a minute. In fact, let's talk about it straight now. So we're going to go onto the unit page and talk about what they've got in their army. All right, so these are the Celts units. And as you can see, first of all, not a huge, you know, unit roster. There isn't a huge amount of diversity to it. It is pretty much old-fashioned kind of getting down to business with swords and spikes and, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, really kind of gritty fighting is what you're going to be doing as a Celts. It's not a huge amount of finesse to this campaign, but it's still a fun one indeed. And also a bit of a lack of cavalry, but we'll talk about it in a second. So we're going to start off, as we always do, with peasants. And pretty much the same for all factions. They're pretty much trash. Poor morale, two attack, five defense. Only really use them to garrison settlements that are never going to be attacked. If you rely on these geezers, you're in for a bad time. Then we're going to move on to the Kerns. Now, these guys are not too bad. I'm not a big fan of, like, javelin skirmisher troops. But honestly, a 9 missile attack for javelinmen, if you are into that kind of thing, isn't actually too bad at all. The attack and defense 6 and 7, respectively, for the melee isn't terrible. Coupled with a charge bonus of 4, which, again, for... Infantry units, particularly javelin units, is really quite rare indeed. Um, but saying that's still not hugely amazing in the melee, it means they're going to be competent if, for example, they run out of javelins, but you're not going to be using them as the backbone of your offensive line or whatever. Um, but still, not too bad. I'm just not a huge fan of javelin men in particular, but I suppose as the Celts, you haven't got a huge amount of choice. If you want a kind of uh, manoeuvrable, agile missile unit, then this is pretty much all you've got. Then we're going to move on to the Druids. Now, the Druids are a very important unit, particularly in this campaign, I think, because the Celts, their morale isn't amazing. Quite a few of the troops, you know, it's a little bit... Some, some of the troops are a little bit underwhelming in terms of morale. So, in particular for this campaign, Druids are very important. Now, they have attack and defense of 11 and 12, respectively, which, first of all, is actually pretty solid, but you guys aren't really going to be using them for fighting, or I hope you wouldn't be, because it probably means that you're very much losing the battle and you're kind of on your last legs. And the reason is because these guys are good for chanting, for that morale boost. Now, they have good morale themselves, but as it says on the screen there, chanting inspires nearby troops. It raises the morale, and what that means, of course, if you're in a sort of precarious situation where you've got two groups of troops fighting it out, you know, the offensive and defensive line battling it out, and it's really a matter of who's going to break first. And you know which unit, whichever unit breaks first, it's going to cause a sort of domino effect around the whole army and everyone's going to be screwed. Well, the Druids will allow your troops to stay alive that little bit longer, get those few more hits in so that it's the opposition that that happens to, and you're all nice and good. So morale, obviously a huge part of Rome Total War, and any unit that can boost morale is a good unit indeed. So I would say for most armies, for most decent sized battles, just get a unit of Druids in and they can make a huge difference, even if it isn't in a sort of direct way, indirectly, they can make a big difference indeed. So I do like my Druids, that's for sure. Then we're going to go on to the Pictish Spearmen. Now this is probably going to be the sort of backbone of your army in the early game. Uh, this is a kind of defensive unit. They're Spearmen, so that's kind of what you'd expect. Attacker 6 is not too you know, amazing, but they're really there to hold the line. They can do a Skiltrum, which if you've played Medieval 2 Total War, you'll know all about. It's essentially a defensive spear formation, kind of like a spear wall. And what that's really good at 
is first of all, it's good for example if you want to blockade a street, so if you're being attacked, if you're under siege and the enemy are coming down the street, they can just block a street, stand there all day and they'll do a pretty decent job just sort of defending the line until maybe you get some cavalry around the back. But also in battle in the open field, again, they're just good for holding units against the line and then you've got to get some cavalry or some light infantry or whatever quickly around the side of the back to sort of close in the trap. But pick this Spearman will do a solid job. It's a shame they don't have good morale, but it's kind of an early game unit. You're going to be using these guys a lot early on because they're pretty, you know, decent price and all that. Um, also, what's good about them is 120 men in the unit on this unit scale but on all unit scales they have more units than uh, sorry more men in the units uh, than most other infantry types which is good because the more men there are in the unit it means that the you know a, a decent amount of them can go down and they've still got a lot to rely, rely upon so not too bad in, at all this is going to be a kind of unit that you're going to be relying upon particularly in the early game and then we're going to go on to the Gallo Glasses. Now this is quite a good unit. Um, more of an offensive unit, I would say. The, the uh, game describes them as a warrior elite amongst their people with double-handed weapons. And that's pretty badass, I think. Double-handed weapons is pretty cool. I, I do like that. It's kind of uh, sort of the more northern European barbarian just sort of chunking your way through. And because of that, of course, they have a better attack. 13 attack because this is a more sort of offensive unit so if you really need to sort of charge forward inflict a lot of damage quickly then these guys will do a good job but their defense actually isn't too bad either and that's because they've got a sort of chain mail uh, I think they're yeah, armored in chain mail to boot as it says and that means they're going to be pretty decently protected as it says well armored good morale they're not going to be too vulnerable to missiles or anything like that. So this is the kind of unit that you can just sort of charge in and they're going to stay alive for a while and get quite a few kills in. Quite a good sort of impact troop, particularly if you want to just completely hit a side of the opposition army. These guys can do a decent job indeed. Then we have the Hounds of Kulan. They are dangerous men indeed. They are berserkers. The repeated stress of battle strong drink or the potent brews of druids make them into slavering blood crazed beasts. That's got to be one of the best descriptions I've seen in a while. Um, 11 attack, 5 defense, 7 charge bones. Now 7 charge bones again, I mean that's pretty good for cavalry, but for infantry, that's very very solid in indeed. But what is good I suppose about these guys and what is you know what they're kind of used for is their sort of berserk mode if they uh, you know they're fighting for a while things are happening their flag above their head will glow red and then they go crazy their morale will be you know increased um, their attack and defense will be increased and they'll just go around chopping people's heads off and they won't give a damn about anything. Now that's good in the sense that of course they can inflict a huge huge amount of damage in a short space of time which is really cool and it means that they can just completely destroy a wing of the army or they can destroy the morale of an army. So using them effectively is a, a very, very dangerous indeed. Of course, what's not good is if you don't want them to go berserk, for example, and they just do go berserk anyway. Um, and if they do go out, you know, if they do go berserk, they'll be completely out of control. And in a sort of more tactical battle where maybe you're trying to maneuver troops or try and get a particular sort of formation down, if some idiots are just going around chopping people's heads off and getting into the, the thick of things when you don't quite want them to yet, that can be quite dangerous as well. Also, what about these guys? They're a decent price. If you compare the Pictish Spearman, a pretty basic defensive unit, 350 denarii, compared to basically nearly 700. It's nearly double the price. And there's way, way less men. Now, these guys, like I say, if you use them situationally, they can be very, very powerful indeed. Excellent morale is quite rare uh, indeed. And, you know, just the fact that they are crazy and they're going to inflict a huge amount of damage is very, very good. But it kind of depends how you want to fight. I prefer to be in control of my troops. But to be honest, if you want a particularly organized tactical army, then you're probably not going to be use, uh, choosing the Celts in the first place. So, you know, this is probably the kind of unit you want to be playing with because it's fun if you uh, are using the Celts in the first place. Next up, we go on to some more missile troops and slingers. Now, this is probably a unit that you're going to be using a decent amount. Now, because they're basically the equivalent of archers, because we haven't really got archers. You know, we've got crossbowmen, which we'll have a look in a second. We've got javelinmen. We've got slingers. You haven't really just got basic archers, which is a bit of a shame of the Celts, because I do quite like my archers. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about the slingers uh, now. Now, the good thing about the slingers is that they have a pretty decent melee defense, which means they're not too much of a liability in battle. If you do have your Hounds of Kulan or your Gallo Glasses charging forward, the slingers, if they're unprotected, it's not the end of the world, which is quite good. 
They are effective against armor, which is also very, very good, particularly as the game goes along. You know, you're going to be fighting factions which have sort of chainmail and proper armor. If these guys can sort of penetrate that, that's very good indeed because uh, you know, that's fairly rare for basic troops anyway. They're also fast moving, so kind of comparable uh, to the what they called again, Kerns, that's it, the Kerns earlier, um, which is cool. Their missile attack is a little bit underwhelming of only three, and that's not particularly amazing. And also, these guys have a pretty trash range as well. Um, but if you upgrade them, you know, if there's one unit I recommend upgrading, it's probably the Slingers, make sure their weapons are up, for example, then they can be a sort of decent solid unit. They can stand there, they can fire their their rocks or whatever they do they seem to have a pretty decent um, ammo capacity as well in my experience and they can inflict a decent amount of damage not an amazing missile troop but you don't really have a huge amount of choice as the celts so this is pretty much all you've got apart from of course the pictish crossbowmen now pictish crossbowmen are an interesting unit because it's not a huge amount of crossbowmen in this game it's quite a sort of um it's more of a medieval two thing to be honest now, the crossbowmen have a pretty decent melee attack and defense, which we just discussed is a, you know, pretty alright thing if you're a, a, a missile troop. It's nice just to sort of not have to rely on the unit. A missile attack of 6 is pretty solid as well. Effective against armor, again, we discussed that's pretty good. I think really the reason that I don't use Pictus crossbowmen so much is because they're kind of a more, uh, you know, you have to sort of upgrade to get them and they can be a bit more expensive and all that. So, that's why I just prefer to use slingers. Um, but crossbowmen can do a job as well so if that's more your kind of thing then I suppose go for it but I just don't really have a huge amount of experience with crossbowmen and I'm not a huge fan personally but hey you guys might like them so there we go and then we have wolfhounds now I've again I talk about lack of experience I don't tend to use dogs um, much in Rome Total War in the base game or in Barbarian Invasion but we'll have a look at them anyway 10 attack 2 defense and that's kind of the thing about dogs dogs can be kind of cool but they just get chopped down so easily that they're more of an annoyance in battle, but what I do quite like about them is if you just want a unit to get sort of chased off into the distance and you don't have to, you don't have to sort of worry about a unit for a while because they're going to be sort of dealing with these pesky dogs, then the wolfhounds can be quite useful in that sense. Um, but of course, once you release them, that's it. They're gone and you can't control them. And like I said earlier, I like to have a sort of decent amount of control over my army, so I'm not a huge fan of them personally. And that kind of goes with the, the uh, Scotty, I think it's called. Scotty Chariots, the Chariots anyway. And again, I've never been a huge fan of Chariots. Um, and the reason really is that they have one defense. And it means they're incredibly, incredibly vulnerable to missiles. They're in insanely vulnerable to spears. I mean, you must have all seen the videos of, in the base game anyway, of a custom battle on a bridge and you have the whatever the Spartan hot plights facing 2,000 Egyptian chariots and the chariots just get slaughtered so you know if you use chariots effectively they can do quite a lot of damage because they have like spiked wheels and all that kind of thing they have a special attack and they can inflict a lot of damage and a lot of morale damage and also they can do a bit of missile damage as well so using them effectively as sort of like a shock unit in times of desperation maybe um, could be a good thing but they're very unwieldy they can just charge without order sometimes um, and also I find in my experience they're much much harder to control than cavalry or you know basic traditional cavalry and I'm just not a huge fan personally I don't like being out of control and I think they're extremely vulnerable you know, especially for the price and all that. Personally, I just rather have ordinary cavalry because I like to have units I can rely upon. But if chariots are your kind of thing, then at least it's cool that you do have chariots. It's quite rare for a barbarian faction to get these, so that's quite cool, I guess. Then we have the noble clansmen. We're finally getting to some proper cavalry. There's not a lot, trust me. Um, they are the elite who owe their position to birth and bravery in equal measure. They are therefore headstrong, fearless, and difficult to restrain. 10 attack, 19 defense. 19 defense is pretty damn solid for cavalry as well. Um, good morale, good stamina means they're going to sort of stay a long time in battle. This is the kind of uh, you know cavalry unit which you can charge in and not worry too much about because they're just going to sort of get on with it and chunk away. Um, a decent charge bones as well means that they can inflict quite a lot of damage upon impact. So not a bad unit, that's for sure. And then finally, of course, we get on to the warlord. You would expect the warlord to be good. Uh, because, of course, these are the guards that are protecting the main geezer himself. 20 defense means that they're going to stay around for a while. 2 hit points. Excellent morale means he's not going to break. Of course, if the general breaks, you're all screwed because 
that doesn't exactly set a good example for the rest of the troops which are meant to be staying around for a long time. So Warlord, a pretty damn solid unit indeed, um, but you know that's the same for all factions really. So these are the Celtic uh, units and we're now going to be looking at some campaign strategy on the campaign map. I'll be a minute. Alright, and this is the Celtic starting position. As usual, we get a notification that the Huns are coming to eat us, although they won't be coming this far, so that's not a big deal for us. And also the Vandals are coming to eat people, but again, not a big deal. Um, well, I say not a big deal, it could be. It depends where you kind of expand, I guess. And a powerful faith, which is paganism, it's a new thing around. So, we start off, like I said in the beginning, with Ireland and with a chunk of what is now modern-day Scotland. And that's it, so two... Two settlements, not too bad because a lot of the barbarian factions only have one. Lombardi, Burgundii, Franks, Alemanni, Saxons, Goths, they all start off with one. In fact, I think pretty much all the barbarian factions do. The Sarmatians and the Roxolani do as well. So we're quite privileged in the sense that we have uh, two settlements, which is nice. One of them's on an island as well, so it's even more defensible. I mean, really, it's unlikely anyone's going to go for Tara or Tara, however you say it early on. Um, Del Ryder. I think that's how you say it. My pronunciation isn't great for this faction, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, you know, a little bit more vulnerable because the Western Roman Empire around, but they've got their own problems, so we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. In fact, in fact, let's talk about them now. And what's interesting is, is that, well, obviously, as the Celts, you haven't got a huge amount of space to expand. Um, you can't expand north into the Black Void. Apparently, there's nothing north of Scotland. And you can't expand into the Black Void over here across the Atlantic. So, really... You've got basically two choices, south or east. Now, let's talk about south first. And um, an obvious kind of strategy would be to try and secure the modern day British Isles as a sort of home base um, to sort of launch upon, a sort of launch pad. Once, of course, you have the British Isles, then you've got a sort of nice defensible island. That's what I like about islands in Rome Total War is that they're, much, you know, they're way less likely to be attacked because it, it takes effort to get a ship over there and there are pirates and all sorts of nonsense that are going to get in your way. Now, the thing is, the Western Roman Empire are in certain ways quite weak. They have political trouble, they have economic trouble, religious, public order, all, all sorts. It's a complete mess, the Western Roman Empire. If you saw my faction guide, you'll know all about that. But I still wouldn't underestimate them. I've always found that the most difficult, or one of the more difficult regions to actually deal with the Western Roman Empire is in Britain. And I don't know why in particular that's the case, but I think Aburicum, that's got a decent amount of troops, and I believe there is a general in Aburicum who has like particular uh, like trait that is good with horses, so he's quite good at commanding cavalry, and this is quite a decent sized army. And then of course they can get reinforcements uh, from Lundinium. So, What's awkward about the Western Roman Empire is they can be a little bit tough, particularly to take a Buricum, especially as you haven't got a huge amount of units to start off with. If you have a look, that's a pretty much nothing really, and that's not too much, and you're going to have to get by ship as well. You haven't got a huge amount to call upon, and the Western Roman Empire actually have a decent amount. Now, they're not going to be calling on lads from over here because they're going to be losing territories like Avaricum and Augusta Trevoron very quickly, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. But if you are feeling confident, trying to take a Buricum and Londinium, probably go for it quickly, but I think for very beginner people, that might not be as easy as it first seems. We'll talk about what to do if you don't feel like taking a Buricum and Londinium in a second. Now, the problem with not taking a Buricum and Londinium and kind of waiting it out is the Romano-British. So if the, um, if the Romans have a settlement that rebels, and bear in mind they have got bad public order issues, so you'd expect that does happen, normally they would rebel into the Western Roman Empire rebels. It's a, I think it's a green colour, I think they're, I think they're the green ones, um, and they'll, yeah, they're green, and they'll, you know, spawn around here as a sort of new army and they'll be causing trouble. But in Britain, um, they'll be the Romano-British instead. For some reason, they decided to create a new rebel faction, the Romano-British, and they can be quite tough indeed. If you've ever looked at the Romano-British units, you know that some of them can be quite strong uh, indeed, and the armies that spawn are no joke. So what is possible if you do hang around and sort of wait until you can build up the strength to take on the Western Roman Empire, actually the Western Roman Empire might be replaced by an even stronger alternative the Romano-British. So maybe storming a Buricum and Londinium early on to eliminate any prospect of the Romano-British coming onto um, Britain, it could potentially be a good idea. Now, saying that, the Romano-British could just rock up anyway. 
you know, Londinium could fall in two turns and then they're here whether you like it or not. So kind of something to consider. How confident do you feel in taking a Burakum in particular and facing that general? I think he's called Placus the Horseman. I don't know how I remember that, but I think he's called Placus the Horseman. Um, I wonder if we can get someone down to have a look. Placus Flavius. I'm pretty sure he's got some sort of trait that's good with horses. Maybe I'm wrong in that, but whatever. He's still got a general. It's still a decent sized army. You've got to weigh in. How confident are you at dealing with the Western Roman Empire? And how confident are you that you could deal with the Romano-British if you do take that gamble and potentially allow for them to arise? Now I'm going to talk about the second option. And one which possibly maybe for more beginners you would want to choose. And I say this quite a lot. I've been saying this a lot recently in the faction guides. Is that... I like taking down the Saxons. I have a bit of a thing about destroying the Saxons, and there's quite a good reason for it. First of all, they only have one settlement, so it's not all too difficult. You take Vicar Saxones nice and quickly, you blitz, you blitz Vicar Saxones, and they're gone, and that's it, no more Saxons. And of course, the second reason why I like to get rid of the Saxons is because they're a non hoardable faction. If you, you know, if you attack the Franks, or the Lombardi, or the Burgundii, or whatever, and you get rid of all their settlements, that's not the end of them because unless you get rid of all their family members, um, because they'll just respawn with new hordes and they can be even more troublesome than the original, kind of the equivalent of the Romano-British being more dangerous than the actual original Western Roman Empire. So getting rid of the Saxons isn't uh, going to be you know, particularly bad in terms of consequences because they can't hoard, which is good for us. Um, so taking them down nice and easily or nice and early means that you don't have to worry about the Saxons. And the third reason really you want to take down the Saxons is because they can become quite formidable. I talked about this in my fa uh, Saxons faction guide. That's a bit of a sort of alliteration there. In the Saxons faction guide, I talked about how some of the units are quite, um, well, they're quite strong. You know, they've got some good heavy infantry. They can be quite dangerous. Now, you might think, well, the Saxons, they're all over here. They're not really my concern. We'll leave them to the Franks and the Lombardi and all that to deal with. Well, the, the Saxons have been known to get on this boat, get on the old boat of Admiral Bert Garda, and go over to the British Isles. I've had that happen before. I don't know how rare that is, but I think it's more common than you think. They do seem to have a bit of an obsession with the, uh, with the British Empire, or not the British Empire, the British Isles, modern-day British Isles. Um, I don't know how, well, I, I suppose it's historically accurate. This isn't really a time period I know a huge amount about, but it doesn't really matter because they're going to come over here anyway, or quite likely. And that means that you could potentially be in the midst of a sort of big battle or, you know, sort of um, war with the Western Roman Empire trying to reclaim this beautiful island. And then the Saxons come along and completely screw everything up. And then you end up getting nothing. So whereas if you go straight over to the Saxons, quickly hop over and get rid of them, then taking the, west of the rest of the British Isles will be easier because you don't have to worry about them sort of sneaking up on your back. Also, it's not a bad launch pad um, that because, it, again, it's a fairly defensible region. And once you do take Vicar Saxones, if you are sort of competent enough to sort of spread your forces this thin, this is something I'd recommend for more uh, seasoned veterans of Rome Total War, probably. But if you are capable of taking Umburicum and Londinium with one force and taking Vicar Saxones with another, then with the second force, you can go and take Chattii and Frisii, and already you start to get a sort of decent empire made up of sort of six settlements fairly early on, although that's not too easy. That is much easier said than done. A warning though, of course, if you do decide to go into this region, uh, make sure you don't attack the Franks, Lombardi or Burgundii, unless you want hordes to be coming at you because that's not too fun. I would focus more on the Western Roman Empire, but really the main advice would be control this region and then just swarm south, take advantage of the Western Roman Empire because they're gonna be having their own struggles. Anyway, I hope that guide was helpful uh, in some capacity and I'll be back with more very, very soon. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you around.